Well, according to that song, who's our rock? Jesus. Jesus. He's our rock. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, and the rock won't move. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, we provide one in the seat in front of you. Turn to the back, that's the New Testament, to page 59, and you should be at Luke chapter 14. We're in a series called Jesus, the Master Storyteller. I want to start by reading this article. She sat in the dirty utility room, rocking him back and forth. He was tiny, barely 10 inches long, when the doctors delivered him. His parents didn't want to hold him, she was told. So for 45 minutes, the only 45 minutes he would have on earth, Jill cradled him, watching his chest rise and fall. Surrounded by the hospital stained sheets and trash, his body felt quiet. Another victim of a live birth abortion. The last she decided she would ever witness. He would be almost 20 now, and there probably isn't a day that Jill Stanek doesn't think about him and the thousands of helpless babies left to die just like him. No one talked much about induced labor abortions back then, but nurses like Jill knew. They were most hospitals' dirty little secret, finding a living, breathing baby alone in a room of medical waste was almost routine. So much so that one of Jill's co-workers accidentally threw a live aborted baby in the garbage, not even realizing it was there in the heap of messy linens, a tiny infant wrapped in a towel, every bit as disposable as our laws have made, have made each person. These are true stories of a country that's hardened its heart to the value of life. Two decades after Jill carried that tiny body to the morgue, we are on the verge of making his end the norm. In the aftermath of New York, we have become a nation of politicians who would resuscitate babies only if that's what the mother and the family desired. And that's not an America anyone should tolerate. Unfortunately, this, they're only worth saving when we decide they are, mentality isn't new. There are others who argue that stories like this don't even exist. Judy Chu from California said, This bill is a solution in search of a problem. It's unnecessary and redundant. She argued last year when Republicans introduced the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. Turns out there's nothing redundant about it. As Alexander de Sanctis points out in NRO, leaving babies alone to die is legal in almost half of the country. Representative Jan Schakowsky, a Democrat from Illinois, claims to agree with the sentiment behind the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act only to turn around and vote against it. She said, of course, if a baby is born alive, then everything must be done to protect that life, she argued. No one disagrees with that. Last year, no one turned out to be 183 House Democrats. All but five refused to stop what's happening in abortion clinics and hospital hospital utility rooms around the country. We're talking about killing a baby that's been born, said Senator Ben Sasse, a Republican from Nebraska. He told his colleagues this last week. We're not talking about some euphemism. We're not talking about a clump of cells. We're talking about a little baby girl who has been born and is on the table in a hospital or medical facility, and then a decision or a debate would be whether or not they could kill this little baby. We're talking about the most vulnerable among us, and we have a public official in America out there again and again defending a practice. This is infanticide that we're talking about. This should be so far beyond any political consideration. We're talking about a little baby, a baby with dignity 
an image bearer. Everyone in the Senate ought to be able to say that killing a little baby is wrong. So Ben Sasse decided to fast-track his Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act after what happened in New York and Virginia and tried to pass the bill by unanimous consent. I'm going to ask all 100 senators to come to the floor and be against infanticide. This doesn't take any political courage. And if there's a member of this body that can't say that, there may be lots of work you can do in the world, but you shouldn't be here. In the end, the only way that Congress will get the message is if you send one. If you haven't called or emailed your senators about the Born Again Abortion Survivors Protection Act, don't wait. Let them know. It takes courage to stand up against society, doesn't it? And today we're going to look at Jesus in Luke chapter 14. He stood up against the society of that day when he stood up against the religious leaders. I titled this message, Another Sabbath Ambush. Another Sabbath Ambush. This week we're going to see what happens when Jesus is invited to a dinner party. A dinner party. Now, verses 1 through 24 is all one setting. It's all one event. But I cannot preach all 24 verses in one message. We would be here when the snow started to fall. But it's one event. How do I know? Well, let's look at the text. Verse 1. It happened then when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. So he's in this house, he's eating bread. Verse 7, and he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor. Verse 12, and he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, all still one event. Verse 15. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said, and then you have 16 through 24, a parable that Jesus says to the response to that man. This is all one event, right? All happening at this dinner party. But we're only going to look at verses 1 through 11 today, and then next week we'll look at 12 through 24 and look at the rest of the dinner party happenings. So let's start reading. Verse 1. It happened that when he, Jesus, he, went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent and he took hold of him and healed him, and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well, and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. Would you join me in prayer, Lord? As we look at the happenings at this dinner party, help us to see clearly the Word of God. We just sang that the word is strong. May it be strong in our lives as we understand the gist of what Jesus is saying and doing. And most of all, may the Holy Spirit apply the word of God to our hearts so that we will be changed somewhat into more of the image of Jesus Christ because of this word. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, when Jesus speaks, will you listen? Remember that E.F. Hutton commercial? When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Well, I want you to listen to what Jesus says. When he speaks, will you listen? So verses 1 through 6, I'm going to ask it in question form. How would you respond in a pressure-filled situation? How would you respond in a pressure-filled situation? I can see right off the bat in my thinking as I'm reading this, that a trap was set against Jesus. There's a trap against Jesus. This whole event is one big setup. They're trying to 
do what's called entrapment. They're trying to get him to say something or do something in which they can accuse him. So first we notice in the first verse that a Pharisee invited Jesus to a meal on which day? The Sabbath day. Now what normally takes place on Sabbath day? Well, no, there is something. All good little Jewish boys and girls go to the synagogue. For what purpose? To worship. They're going to read God's word, to pray, to, um, well, to have a message given. It's kind of like what we do in church. So in the morning, they would go to synagogue. So is Jesus eating at a breakfast meal? Probably not. This is probably happening after the Sabbath day worship at the synagogue. Now, who does this house belong to that he goes to? Not just one Pharisee, but a, one of the rulers, one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Now, recall, Pharisee means separated ones. It means that these Jewish people are separated from the culture of the, of the Greeks and the Romans. We're going to stay, stay truthful to the word of God as we know it. We're going to worship and serve Yahweh, the Lord, and we're not going to let culture affect us. We're going to stay true to God's word. The house belongs to one of the Pharisees, a separated one. Now, is this one of those, hey, Jesus, we, I saw you in synagogue. How about coming over and meeting the family and having a meal with us? Is that one of the settings of this? No. This is not come and greet the family. We know this because in verse 3, Jesus addresses lawyers and Pharisees. There are more Pharisees than just the ruler. And when it says lawyers, it means those that were expert in Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. Math, Matthew, that's gospel. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Torah. They're experts in that. And what does it say they're doing to Jesus in the first verse at the very end of the verse? They're watching him closely. They're scrutinizing him. They're waiting, carefully observing what is he going to do. Isn't this just a friendly dinner? No, it's a setup. It's a trap. Because as they're watching Jesus closely, the text tells us, There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, what's dropsy? Edema. What's edema? Well, it's when your limbs are swollen with excess body fluid. Excess body fluid. Here's a picture. Okay, see how the foot is, the fluid in the foot is just expanded. It just makes your limbs just swell. This man's suffering from dropsy. Okay, he's in pain. Now, is he one of the dinner guests, do you think? Do you think the Pharisee invited him to sit down and have dinner with them? No. First of all, in Leviticus, it tells us that if you have an excess of body fluid and if there's any kind of seepage at all, any kind of discharge, you're considered to be unclean. You're not to be touched in any way, unclean. There's no way a Pharisee is going to invite somebody with dropsy to eat the meal with them. Now, recall back in that culture, did they have tables with chairs around a table when they ate? No. How did they eat? Pretty much on the floor. They'd have low-rise tables, and they'd be having these pillows uh, uh, against the wall, and the tables are set up in a U-shaped, and the host would sit in the bottom of the U, and everybody else would sit around this U, and the servants would come with the food into the middle section of the U and deliver the food to you as you're kind of like reclining, laying down on a pillow as you're eating. It's kind of like a big banquet type of a meal. And so where's this man with dropsy? In front of Jesus. How could it be in front of Jesus if the table's right in front of Jesus? He's on the inside of the U. He's not invited to eat this meal. What's he doing there? Who brought him there? We don't know. That's our assumption. But if you have the disease or the ailment of dropsy, is that immediately noticeable? Oh, yeah. 
let's get somebody who's immediately noticeable having some kind of sickness and put him in front of Jesus, and then let's just watch him closely to see what he does. Which day is this? Sabbath day. Are you allowed to work on the Sabbath day? No. And the only reason this man is there is to trap Jesus. Did the Pharisees care whether or not this man was healed? Probably not. Was it out of pity and concern saying, hey, we're going to invite Jesus to this meal and let's find some people that he can heal because we love mankind? No. Did the Pharisees already have some run-ins with Jesus? <laughs> yeah, let's look, let's look back in Scripture a little bit. Luke 6, verse 6. On another Sabbath, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and was teaching, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely. That's the exact same Greek word as we have in Luke 14. Watching him closely. Why? Well, to see if he healed on the Sabbath. Why? So that they might find reason to accuse him. Was that a setup? <laughs> Chapter 7, in verse 36, another Pharisee invites Jesus to a meal. His name is Simon. And a woman comes in and anoints his feet and watches and dries his feet with her hair. Remember that story? Yeah. And Simon the Pharisee says, if, if he were a prophet, he would know what sign of, kind of woman this is, that she is a, well, I'm not going to go into that, immoral woman. And then Jesus tells that parable about one guy owes 50, another guy owes 500 denarii, who's going to love more? Anyway, that was a run-in at a meal. Let's turn back to Luke 11. In Luke 11, verse 37. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. Okay, they're down low. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that Jesus had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord, meaning Jesus, said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you, you are full of robbery and wickedness. That's good dinnertime conversation, right? He's invited by the Pharisee and he blasts them. He says in verse 40, You foolish ones. In verse 42, but woe to you, Pharisees, for you do this kind of stuff. Verse 43, but woe to you, Pharisees, woe to you, to you in verse 44. In verse 45, one of the lawyers, one of those experts in the Torah, said to him, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. And so then he said, woe to you, lawyers. Where's all this taking place? At the dining room table. And look at verse 52. He finally sums up. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hinder those who were entering, meaning into the kingdom. Now when Jesus had left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects. Why? Plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. Are the Pharisees on Jesus' side? No, they're really his opponents. In chapter 12, under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people, this really irked the Pharisees that there are thousands of people having gathered together, that they're stepping on one another. Well, Jesus began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Chapter 13, it was surprising when some of the Pharisees said, Herod wants to kill you, better leave here. And then in chapter 14, we have this dinner invite. Okay, you got the context? 
Here's a man with dropsy in the middle in front of Jesus. And what are they doing? They're watching him closely. And Jesus bravely walked into the trap and did what was right. He did what was right. He didn't shy away from that situation, right? As soon as he walked in the door, did he know that there was somebody in there that probably shouldn't have belonged in that, that setting? Oh, yeah. And he walks right in and he does the right thing. He starts off by asking a question of these lawyers, these experts in the law of Moses and of the Pharisees. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? It requires a yes or no answer, right? Yes, it's lawful, or no, it's not lawful. But they don't answer. It says they kept silent. The room is silence. Here they are, they're watching Jesus closely, and they kept silent. They're refusing to answer. Do they care about that man with dropsy? Not at all. They remain silent. Is this evil? I think so. So what does Jesus do? He took hold of the man. That means he touched him, right? Here's a righteous man touching a man who's considered to be unclean. According to the Pharisees, if you touch somebody unclean, it makes you unclean. That's what I love about Jesus. He took hold of the man and healed the man, and then he sends him on his way. The man's healed. Back in chapter 13, when we had a woman who was bent over, double, remember that? Bent over? What does she do when Jesus touches her and heals her and raises her and she's erect? What does she do? She immediately praises God, gives glory to God. And all the people in the crowd were giving glory to God over all the glorious things done by Jesus. It said in verse 17 of chapter 13. Is there rejoicing in this dining room table meal? Is anybody saying, glory to God, a man who was suffering from dropsy is healed? No. It is silent in that room. And after sending the man away, Jesus questioned his opponents with this practical illustration in verse 5. See, the gist of what Jesus says is, which one of you will refuse to save a life on a Sabbath day, right? Which one of you will refuse to save a life on the Sabbath? Suppose, here's the illustration, suppose you have a son, your son or your ox, what you need to live on, all the work that your ox does, that falls into a well. Suppose that your son or ox falls into you, what are you going to do? Well, a well, do, are wells normally dry wells or is there water normally in wells? Yeah. So in the illustration, if your son falls in the well, what are you going to do? Are you going to let him drown because it's a Sabbath day? Is that what you're really going to do? Or are you going to immediately pull them up on the Sabbath? Are you going to save a life or are you going to let the life die? Do the Pharisees know the right answer? Yeah, will they, will they admit the right answer? No. They know it's right to save a life. Jesus said in Mark 2, 27, Sabbath, the Sabbath day was made for man, for man's benefits. Not man for the Sabbath. We don't serve the day, the day serves us, Jesus said. Deeds of mercy are always right to do on a Sabbath day. But they have hard hearts. They cannot admit Jesus is right. They will not admit Jesus is the Messiah. They certainly won't admit he's God's son. 
they remain stubborn in their sin. Do you know anybody that remains stubborn in their sin? Anybody? I don't care what you teach, what you say. I'm my own man. I'm going to do what I want to do. They remain stubborn in their sin. It says they make no reply. They could make no reply to this. At first, they're silent. They're watching him closely. When he asks the question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? They remain silent. And now Jesus actually silenced them. Here's the point. Always do the right thing in pressure-filled situations. Will you ever find yourself in a pressure-filled situation when the whole culture is against you and yet you're going to stand for Jesus? You ever find yourself in that kind of pressure situation? I was pleased uh, this week that our president took a stand regarding the abortion issue. And shortly after that speech, I think it was the next day, I get in my mailbox the Decision Magazine from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I get their monthly magazine. And the cover says, silent about sin. Why do many pastors avoid warning against homosexuality and abortion? Here we go. Okay, talk to me. Why don't you, Billy, from heaven. <laughs> so I started reading. The first article is by Franklin Graham, Billy's son. The title of that article, it's a short one, two-pager, it says, When Truth is Labeled Hate Speech. When Truth is Labeled Hate Speech. Franklin Graham writes, Recently, social media giant Facebook arbitrarily decided to ban my personal account over a post from two years ago. To their credit, Facebook issued an apology and restored my account. I accepted their apology, and I am grateful for it. Two years ago, I had posted about a North Carolina bill that sought to ensure that public bathrooms were available to individuals according to their birth identity, not their self-identified gender. In other words, biological males could not frequent a lady's restroom. Here's the entirety of my post that Facebook banned. It starts like this. Bruce Springsteen, a longtime gay rights activist, has canceled his North Carolina concert. He says the NC, North Carolina law, HB2, to prevent men from being able to use women's restrooms and locker rooms is going backwards instead of forwards. Well, to be honest, Franklin writes, we need to go back, back to God, back to respect and honoring his commands, back to common sense. Mr. Springsteen, a, a nation embraces sin and bowing at the feet of godless secularism and political correctness is not progress. I'm thankful North Carolina has a governor, Pat McCrory, and a lieutenant governor, Dan Forrest, and legislators who put the safety of our women and children first. HB2 protects the safety and privacy of women and children and preserves the human rights of millions of faith-based citizens of this state. Facebook said that I had violated their hate speech policy. Did you see anything hateful in that post? Of course not. I simply stated that the proposed legislation protected women at risk by banning potential pedophiles Uh, predators from public bathroom facilities. Not only that, but it was a clear violation of God's moral standards. Well, that flies in the face of God's standard truth when we allow moral authority to be what the culture dictates. God's standard of truth, His inerrant and infallible word where believers firmly stand, Facebook admitted they were in error in banning my account, but it is only a matter of time until those who express the timeless truths of the gospel are marginalized or even persecuted because of their beliefs. 
The Bible says that an unbelieving and unrepentant world is the object of God's wrath because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That is exactly what is happening on a massive scale. As our world moves further and further away from, the God, away from God and hates righteousness and truth. Nowhere is this more evident than in the two most pressing moral issues of our day, abortion and homosexuality. Since the Supreme Court made abortion legal in Roe v. Wade in 1973, more than 60 million babies have been callously murdered by the so-called physicians who betrayed their oath and defy God every time they kill a baby. And since the 2015 Supreme Court ruling of Obergefell and Hodges that officially recognized and legalized gay marriage, the entire LGBTQ agenda has been heartily endorsed and promoted by virtually every sector of our culture. And if you oppose either one, you quickly draw the ire and disdain of the new moral police, as I have discovered. But what saddens me even more than the prevailing godless worldview on these issues is the failure of the church to preach compellingly and consistently against abortion and homosexuality. There is an awful scarcity of pulpits across our country that present both issues in light of God's word. The liberating good news of God's forgiveness the liberating good news of God's forgiveness is always more compelling and attractive than any sin. And for those who have had an abortion, there is pardon and grace if they will repent and confess their sin. And for those trapped in homosexuality, there is freedom and deliverance if they will turn to the Lord with a contrite and repentant heart. But how can a person trapped in sin be set free if they don't even know what sin is? This is where the church is stumbling. Are pastors afraid of how their congregations would receive the unvarnished truth of God's word on these topics? Abortion is murder. To be pro-abortion is to be pro-murder. A homosexual lifestyle is a shameless rebellion against the wise design of our creator God. And there is a dire penalty to be paid. I want to encourage pastors and congregations across the nation to expound with crystal clear conviction the biblical truth about sin, all of sin, which includes abortion and homosexuality. The church should be the bulwark of God's truth that stands boldly against such behavior. Even as the culture heartily endorses it, if we as believers don't staunchly oppose such sinful practices, then the floodgates of evil will eventually overwhelm us. Is Franklin right? Make no mistake, Faith Community Church is pro-life. All of life. From the unborn to the aged. This idea that you're viable, we'll let you live. You're not viable, we'll terminate your life. Who's going to be the one that decides who's viable at old age? Is there a certain age and all of a sudden, okay, you're not productive in society anymore, you need to go. All right, I'm not going to get worked up. Well, I'm going to say this. Always do the right thing, even in pressure-filled situations. Always do the right thing. Jesus did the right thing, didn't he? The whole table is set against him. All these Pharisees and lawyers, people who knew God's word. Are you going to heal on the Sabbath day? Absolutely he's going to heal. Because Jesus sees a person, a man who is suffering. Are you going to do the right thing when it comes to social issues in our culture? Well, let's continue looking at what took place next at the dinner party. Verse 7. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor 
at the table, saying to them, When you were invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you were invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So I, I ask this question, how should you behave in social gatherings? How should you behave in social gatherings? Well, Jesus addressed this by speaking a parable to the invited guests. Notice, what's he seeing? He's seeing how people were picking out the places of honor. I need to get to the best seats. Here's the best seat right here. Nobody sits in the best seat. The front row. Now, in church, the best seats are the back row. So Jesus is noticing how people are picking out the places of honor. Now, the illustration he's using here is a wedding banquet or a wedding feast. The ceremony is taking place, and now they're going to celebrate. So where's the best places when you go to a wedding and you're at the reception? Where's the best places? Closest to the bride and groom. Not the food. Otherwise, you sit by the kitchen door. <laughs> Nobody wants to sit by the kitchen door. <laughs> you want to sit by the bride and groom with the family up front. And so Jesus at this dinner party is watching how everybody wants to sit which part of the U-shaped table? Yeah, the bottom part of the U. The bottom part of the U. Because that's where the host is. That's where Jesus probably was. And that's the best place. And so they're all vying for that best place. Where do they not want to sit? At the end of the U, because that's where the servants are coming in with all the food, with the clanking of dishes and all that. And, and they always go to the U first and serve them, and they serve the people at the edges last. So you get last, you're by the kitchen, you're by the racket, and if it's a cold day, it's, they let all the cold air in right on you. So Jesus, in this illustration of a wedding feast, he says, look, don't take the place of honor meaning the seat closest to the bride and groom. Because it could be that the host that's invited people to this wedding will see somebody much more distinguished than you come in, not find a seat, and so he'll come up to where you're sitting, tap you on the shoulder and say, get up. Give your place to this man. And then you've got to find some place else to sit, and you're going to go to the least favorite spot. So what Jesus is saying in this illustration is, instead of taking the place of honor, go and sit in that least favorite spot. Choose to sit by the kitchen door. Perhaps the host is going to see where you are, and he's going to say to you, friend, move up higher. And then you will have honor in the eyes of all your table mates. King Solomon said the same thing in the book of Proverbs, similar thing. In Proverbs 25, verse 6, Solomon wrote, Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men. For it is better that it be said to you, come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen, right? Right? Better to be in a lower spot and then be acknowledged than be told to move down. And Jesus ends this parable, this illustration, with what I'm calling contrary to the world principle. Contrary to the world principle, verse 11. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, the world that we live in elevates the qualities of pride, prestige, and power, right? 
Pride, prestige, and power. Those are great qualities that we want to have in our culture. We want to feel important, that we matter, that we have a reputation, that people notice us. Those are the goals of this world. And yet Jesus is promoting just the opposite goal. See, if you exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. If you humble yourself, you're going to be exalted. Now, what's this idea of humility? It means you walk around with an Eeyore complex from Winnie the Pooh. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I don't matter. Now, humility isn't putting yourself low. Warren Wiersbe says it this way. Humility is not thinking lowly of ourselves. After all, we're made in the image of God, right? We've been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. We're not to be thinking lowly of ourselves. He says humility is not thinking of ourselves at all. It's not about me. I don't think about myself. In God's realm, in God's kingdom, humility is a chief virtue. But humility doesn't come naturally to us, does it? Because we are people of pride. We struggle with that, to be humble, not to be thinking of ourselves. Scripture is full of principles about that we should be people of humility. Let's look at the Old Testament first, a couple Proverbs. Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, arrogant, full of pride. But humility goes before honor. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, he says this in Daniel 4, 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. How does Nebuchadnezzar know that God is able to humble those who walk in pride? Because if you read Daniel 4, you'll know that he was the illustration of God humbling a man. He's a wise king. Look what I've done for Babylon. And God says, I'm going to strike you down and you're going to act like an animal for seven periods of time. And he was made to be like one of the cattle eating out of the field. So when Nebuchadnezzar says, I know he is able to humble those who walk in pride, he's speaking from true life experience. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 18, 4. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Who's the greatest? The one who humbles himself. Matthew 23, verse 12. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Exact same verse that we have here in Luke chapter 14, just in a different context. So here's the point. As a Christian, I follow Jesus' example, and therefore we must take the path of humility every time. Every time. One of the most dynamic preachers of our day finds himself now sidelined, sidelined from ministry, not because of sexual sin, but sidelined from ministry because of this issue called pride. Without going into the details of this man's difficulties, let me say that any pastor, self-included, any pastor has an ongoing battle with pride. We have ongoing battles with pride. And this is especially true if you're a pastoring a mega church. It's easy to look at the church as somehow being our work. And any success in the church is 
from our doing. How blinded we as pastors can become. That is why this application point is so important. Christians follow whose example? Jesus' example. We must take the path of humility every time. Jesus is our example. Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ has. What's the attitude? Well, in verses 8 through 11, he tells us, Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Who's the he humbled himself? Context is Jesus. Think of how Jesus humbled himself. He's God's son. He dwells in glory. We call it heaven, the place where God is. And he left heaven, he left glory to become a man. The creator became the created. And not only did he humble himself by becoming a man, the verse goes on to say, and also he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. A normal death? Death on a cross with other criminals. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus there is going to be a few knees who bow before him no every knee will bow before him of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth what does that mean under the earth the ones who have died do you realize you can say, I'm against Jesus. I don't believe any of this stuff you're saying from God's word. But there's coming a day when every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who's our example? Jesus. He humbled himself by becoming a man by dying on a cross. And therefore, for this reason, God highly exalted him. Now, the New Testament writers, James and Peter, emphasize this teaching on humility. Look at these last few verses then in closing. James 4, 6. But he, meaning God, but God gives us a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I don't want God opposing me. Do you? James 4.10, four verses later. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And what? He will exalt you. Humble. He will exalt you. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. You younger men, now he's writing to a whole group of people to the church. He just got done talking about how the elders are shepherds in 1 Peter 5. But he says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, now who's all of you? All of you. The whole church. Clothe yourselves with humility. Humility. Toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Christians are to be known for their humility, right? Not for being full of pride. Human nature wants to look what I've done. It's all about pride. We are to be like Jesus. So let me ask you, how are you doing when we come to these polar opposites, pride and humility? Where are you?
Why did Lucifer fall from heaven? Pride. I want to be like God. Why did Adam and Eve fail in the garden? Pride. Hey, serpent said to them, look at this forbidden fruit. You know, if you take a bite out of that, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Pride. I want to be like God. Every one of us battles with pride. God's opposed to the proud. But he gives grace to who? The one who's humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Father, we come before you and we think of the scriptures that we've looked at today. We saw how Jesus did the right thing going against what was custom of that day. Lord, it's such a lesson to us to take a right stance in so many things in our culture. Not to be offensive, but to stand on truth. And Father, help us to stop trying to put honor on ourselves and recognize that you're opposed to that kind of thinking, that kind of behaving pridefully. And help us to be more humble, just like Jesus. Not so that you are going to exalt us. That's just a byproduct of being humble. So Lord, help us to become a church of people filled with humility. That everything we do, we do because the Spirit of God enabled us to be successful in that task. May all glory go to Jesus. May all glory and praise go to you, Father God, and for the Spirit who indwells us. And forgive us for the times when we accomplish something and take all the glory. So we pray these things in Jesus, our Savior's name.